Hello, everybody. And welcome to the PC Gamer Show for January 30th, 20... Oh, what was it? 20 Grind Teen. 20 Grind Teen, because... I had all these optimistic names to begin off the year, or, or rhymes to, to, to start the year, but uh, it's starting to feel like a grind already. All, all of the mad happening online. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. And it's a yes, yes, Jules. Jules in chat says, gotta grind it. Um, it's a grind getting through it sometimes between the, well, the discussion topics of today, the Anthem demo, which kind of uh, had a rough start and a, well, a rough lifetime overall, I think. But uh, we, we've played enough to have thoughts. Um, Jared's going to talk us through the RTX 2060 and his thoughts on uh, NVIDIA's, I guess, more affordable. Uh, RTX card, um, and then we're going to talk about Epic buying digital exclusivity for games in a tasteful or not fashion, and discuss about or talk about you know wh what that means for us as consumers, we the consumers uh, versus PC gaming as a whole. But let me introduce the crew first. We got Chris Livingston, staff writer. Chris, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me on your show, James. Yes, thank you for being on the show with me. Looking forward to the grind. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun grind, at least. And Jared Walton. How you doing, How Jared? You? I'm doing all right. Uh, face scars notwithstanding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, uh, I don't know, did you get uh, roughed up in, in an online lobby or something? Or Yeah, I was talking trash about Steam and people beat me up. No, uh, <laughs> I... Uh, I actually took vacation last week and went snowmobiling in rural Star Valley, Wyoming. And mm -hmm. at one point, I uh, kind of got hit by a tree. Well, I, I got you, you got hit tree, by a tree. It, it, it attacked me, like really. I did you. not run into said tree. It jumped out at me. You know? <laughs> uh, snowmobiles are, they were big 800cc. Um, I was on a, a skidoo, so. It was a beast, and it was a lot of fun, but uh, they're a little unwieldy at times, and I am a beginner, so accidents are bound to happen. Let the power get to your head, Jared. Yeah. I don't know. What would you uh, rate the experience of driving a snowmobile in real life versus in a video game? Better? Worse? It's, How the graphics? I, it's, it's a lot more fun in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's also a heck of a lot more scary. I mean, like... <laughs> I, I've been snowmobiling a couple times in my life beforehand, but they were both like 20, 25 years ago. And yeah. I think we were on little rinky dink, like 250 or 400 CC uh, snowmobiles back then. And I mean, now it's like you, you got it. I think I got up to about 65 and that was not even all the way floored. I was still gaining speed and I just ran out of space to accelerate. So um, 65 on the snow bouncing around is pretty insane. <laughs> That is very fast. That is very. That's too fast, Jared. Calm down, man. But I'm, I'm glad you're okay. I'm glad that the tree just gave you a warning, at the very least. Yeah, it's. I had my goggles off when I was turning around because they fogged up, and like if you look at my face, I'm like, I'm lucky I'm not blind in both <laughs> eyes right now. Yeah. So. Live to test hardware another day. That's right. That's good. Well, we're glad because we we need you. We desperately need you. Uh, any, did you get any gaming in over your, over your vacation or just focus on the family uh, stuff? I pretty much, well, you know, rural Wyoming, I, I just, <laughs> I actually had to do some work before I left. So I was finishing up a few last performance analysis videos right. and, uh, and then I checked out. So I took my laptop, but I did not play any games on it. Good. We need a break. Sometimes That's we need right. a break. Have a near death experience. Everybody needs a little time away. Yep, yep. Well, uh, I'm going to assume that means you have no gaming highlights of the week. Uh, and just ask Chris. Chris, what are your gaming highlights? My gaming week? highlights? Um, well, I actually have a few, but uh, there's two I can't talk about for reasons I can't talk about. Um, I've been playing some <laughs> <Love Vargas>. games <laughs> that you'll read uh, in the near future. Okay. Yeah. Um, but one thing I can't talk about, I started playing Vulcanoids, which just came out in early... Early access. It's a first-person steampunky survival uh, base building crafting uh, indie game. Um, and not to get into the whole story because I wasn't really paying attention that much in the intro. But um, you used to live on this very nice island. Then there was 
a bunch of bad things happen and you had to flee the island and now you've come back in a submarine and you're going to retake the island from evil robots uh i think okay. and you're going to do this by sort of crafting and building and <clears throat> your uh your mate your base is this sort of giant drill ship which is a ship with a big drill on it so you can burrow underground and it's like your base it's where all your uh factories that you'll be using to kind of uh build things with resources that you harvest it's kind of got this cool like steampunky vibe to it um and in the middle of this island is this volcano that will explode every now and then and erupt and cover the island with this cloud of ash um so at the very beginning of the game, you're on the submarine you came in, which is like kind of like your temporary base, and you get this warning that the volcano is going to erupt and you should hide in the submarine. And I'm like, well, I want to see the volcano erupt. I mean, yeah. So I go stand out on the dock and I'm just staring, and it blows up, and it looks really cool, and it's very loud. And um, then I realize, you know, I'm probably about to die. So I there was a there was a glitch. I ran in and shut the door, and somehow fell through the world. Uh, it's early access, it, just to say that. It's early access, will be an early access for a couple of years. Right. But So then I, I reloaded the game, and I'm like, okay. So this time the volcano erupted, I shut the door and I went in, and it said, um, it said, you can use the periscope to see what's going on outside. I was like, oh, perfect. I w so I'm running around the sub, like, I can't find the periscope. There's all these, like, the, all the walls and ceilings have all these, like, modules and, like, your storage yeah. and your resource thing and your factories and i couldn't find the periscope thing so i'm like well i'll just maybe it's over and i can open the door and pop out and it wasn't over and i opened the door and i died again <laughs> so then i said okay i'm not gonna watch the volcano this time i'm just gonna work i went outside when it was safe i got my first drill ship going and uh so i'm i have my drill ship and i decided to travel so i drill underground I get the notification that the volcano is going off. I'm like, oh, you know what? Like, whenever you tunnel with your drill ship, it gives you this cool kind of little uh, animation thing you can watch from outside your ship. Mm -hmm. So you see, like, the doors fold up and the gears start spinning. And it looks yeah. really cool. And I noticed when I went underground, like, you could see the volcano in the background. It's like, oh, it'd be cool to see, like, my ship burrow under just as the vol volcano explodes. That'd be, like, a cool little thing to record. Uh, so I tunneled immediately back up to the surface but when you get up up to the surface your door opens automatically <laughs> so i Good. i got up to the surface the door opened and the volcano had just gone off and killed me third time so i've died three times to the volcano that gives you like five minutes warning before it's going to go off it's just i just feel like it's inexcusable to die that many times yeah to something that is completely avoidable so that's been my experience so far but I mean, it sounds novel, like, at least, the uh, the the approach with the drill. So are you going out and, like, doing traditional constructive early access survival game stuff, yeah, like bashing it's, trees and building? Um, I haven't bashed any trees, but I have okay. used, like, a pickaxe to mine, like, copper and coal to okay. power the ship. Um, so I have a shotgun. Base, I have a, what's that? Does your base or everything outside get wiped out every time the volcano goes off? No, no, you're safe. Oh. You're safe inside. It seems like you're safe in your sub. Um, I, I think my drill ship doesn't need to be underground. At least it didn't tell me. Okay. Um, I think you're, as long as you're not standing out on the island like an idiot, like I was, I think you're safe. So you're not building structures outside or anything like that. Uh, I don't know if you build outside structures. I think you. I think you add to your drill ship to make it bigger and bigger. As far as I know, but um. Yeah, not, not too far into it yet, but okay. it seems cool so far. Um, I like the steampunk thing. Having a having a mobile base that can drill underground is pretty sweet. I that's think. tight. That's that's tight. Probably worth checking okay. out for that alone. Yeah, watch out for the volcano, though. <laughs> that's no. what we all need once Fallout or Far Cry 5 eruption happens, right? I mean, the, the bomb. Right. Yeah, that's kind of like the bomb. It's kind of like the bomb in that game. Or the tree uh, in Jared's. Hey, I've got non-gaming highs that are hardware related. Can I talk about those? Yeah, sure. Anything gaming related, anything adjacent so, to our hobby. So those of you who don't know, PC Gamer and Maximum PC are owned by the same company. Maximum PC is this magazine. Our hardware section is like on PCGamer.com. But uh, 
it's kind of it's been around for 25 years or something like that and we kind of get extreme hardware now and then um so if you know of falcon northwest they are like this super high-end mm -hmm. boutique system builder kind of like origin but they've been around a lot longer so they just sent me um their top of the line system it's insane so it's it's basically every high-end component you could put in a pc it's a uh, dual titan rtx cards what so that's five thousand dollars right there just to get you started uh two thousand dollar intel i9 9980 xe processor 128 gigabytes of ram so <laughs> you're upsetting me more, more ram than most people have well not most but more RAM than some people have solid state storage. Uh, and then just to top it off, it's got dual 970 Evo, two terabyte drives in RAID, and then a four terabyte 860 Evo SATA drive. So, I mean, it's it's a beast. And it's in my office behind me right now. It heats up the place that uses about 250 watts sitting idle. Cool. Uh, and uh, if you're playing a game that uses SLI, so you're taxing both the CPU and both GPUs, uh, it's it peaks at around 900 watts. Hot so. damn! Have you have you uh, played any anything on it that uh, makes oh, use yeah, of that ran... RTX stuff? Ray tracing. So <laughs> this is the irony. It's got dual Titan RTX cards, right? Yeah. Um, there's only one ray tracing game right now. That's Battlefield, right? Battlefield Five. Battlefield. Battlefield Five does not support SLI. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> So even with your five thousand oh, graphics man. cards, you're not actually. I mean, it's faster than a twenty eighty Ti yeah. uh, or single Titan RTX, but like it's it's still not playable at four K sixty because man. the second card sits there twiddling its thumbs. I gotta ask so, Jared, like while we're on the subject, what like I'm trying to understand Nvidia's motive for releasing these cards so early. Or, or at least like releasing the capability and, and advertising them as uh, ray tracing capable cards. Like why, when they are clearly, well, and they knew they clearly wouldn't be as capable or as, as supported right out of the gate. I mean, like they, I think they had ambitions that it would go better than it has. Okay. Uh, but like, if, if you go back far enough, I believe the transition from GeForce 2 to GeForce 3, I might have that wrong. Mm. Uh, one of those early transitions, the cards added features, but didn't really get faster at the time. So yeah. it, it was like we went from DirectX 7 to DirectX 8 or something like that. And there were no games that used DirectX 8 at the time. And so the card was just basically is like, well, you could have like a GeForce 2 and upgrade to the fastest GeForce 3. And you're like, I only got like 20% faster. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. So... Uh, except that the pricing wasn't like $500 more than the outgoing high-end card. Hmm. Um, but, you know, N NVIDIA, AMD, like everyone has talked about, hey, when are we going to be able to do real-time gray tracing for a long time? And we're still not quite there, but this is like your foot is in the door in a big way now. We've got the API that games can now target. We'll get faster hardware. So, you know, I think this first generation, it, it's definitely one that's not bad to give a pass on, especially if you've got like a 10 series card, you know, but but long term, I think, you know, the next generation or the one beyond that, like we'll all of a sudden start getting affordable cards that can run ray tracing better than today's high end RTX cards. And, you know, that will be, that's a, that's a major inflection point to even do like modest amounts of ray tracing real time is pretty impressive from a right. graphic standpoint. Right. I, I, yeah, I just mean the average yeah. Joe or Jane is going to see yeah. that on the box and be like, oh, shit, I can do this cool new thing. And then they will try. And then Tomb Raider will be running at 20 frames a second. And... Well, I mean, like, we don't have Tomb Raiders. <laughs> right, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but yeah. and, and the stupid thing is, like, Battlefield Five is the, in my opinion, it's like the worst example of how to do ray tracing because it only does reflections. So no shadows, no lighting. Um, nothing except the reflection. So it's like, well, if you're near a glassy surface or a reflective surface, okay, you can create some cool screenshots. Mm. But in the middle of a game, like it, for a long time in games, I would just turn off reflections if I wanted faster performance because they're one of the things that matters least. It's like, hey, do I really care if the puddle is accurately refre reflecting the sky or faking it? And I'm like, 
you know, right. most people are like, I'll take the thinking it if it's twice as fast. Okay. So, well, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, the RTX series once we yes. get to the, the 2060. I ask, I ask this question because I'm at a point where I'm like, oh, gosh, I have a nine, 980 Ti, which I thought would be the only card I ever need again when it came out. Uh, but now I have a 2560 by 1440 monitor and I won't, and it, oh. you know, I can run games at 140 plus frames a second, uh, ideally. Well, it's 165 so Hertz topped out, uh, yeah. but I can't hit that benchmark ever in a lot of the games that are, are coming out recently. Uh, well, I hate to spoil this for you, but even with a Titan RTX, there are a lot of games that you won't get 165 frames per second. Yeah. Because they are oh. CPU or or engine limited, like Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It didn't matter what you did in that game; you were not going to run case by case basis for sure. Yeah. I yeah, I don't know. Well, I'll I'll, I'll turn the show into a, a, basically a topic about buying advice for me. Uh, Hard work. Well, you know, nine eighty Ti is a bit slower than a ten seventy, and a ten seventy is now a bit slower than an RTX twenty six. Yeah, that's it, it's feeling like the next. If I buy a card. The logical thing to get, but eh, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I wouldn't do twenty sixty for you. I'd okay. say I'd say you got to go. You got to go for at least the twenty seventy. I got I got a cash. Are you kidding me? <laughs> to get the upgrade. All right. Well, we'll see. Um, but first, let me just go over my highlight real quick. My highlight. I feel like I feel like it's old already, but I'm playing Resident Evil 2 the remake, and I've never played the first game, so I have no point of reference for any of these like sly in jokes or or anytime I, there are a lot of moments where it feels like it's supposed to be this like holy shit remember this uh moment but i don't because i never played the, that game even so it's 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 that perfect mix of like silly and serious um that somehow stays scary throughout uh and and the absurdity of the puzzles, like you're in a, po a fucking police station, and <laughs> to get to the parking garage, you need to find three um, three pendants hidden throughout the police station and put <laughs> slot them into a statue or the base of a statue, which will then reveal an underground passage <laughs> that takes you to the parking garage. <laughs> so I, I want to go to that police station. I know. I, just, I imagine the day to day, like, oh, see you later, Greg. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. And, and, oh, shit, where's the lion pendant? You know, and they're running all around. Deb, do you have the lion pendant? Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Uh, that silly stuff, like, works in this game uh, somehow still. I, I don't know, just because the, the plot is ludicrous. Um, but somehow it, it, the, the graphical style is very, it, it's treated with realism and, and uh, almost makes that stuff funnier and, and more entertaining. But uh, I, I, the highlight is, of course, this. This uh, maybe you've seen him on the memes lately. Uh, Mr. X, the tyrant, is this enemy they throw at you pretty early on, and I'm pretty sure this guy's unkillable. Uh, he is like the perfect embodiment of of this silly plus serious plus scary uh, ethos of Resident Evil. <laughs> you're 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 at this like major what feels like it's going is going to be a major relief point. Um, like I can't remember exactly what I don't know the plot it's nonsense but you accomplish a thing you're headed back to the main hall and you're like oh, okay I think I'm gonna get out of here at the very least like uh, find out something new that helps me along the way and lo and behold some guy no cutscene no fanfare or anything just like <laughs> there's a helicopter has crashed in the police station and as you go to walk by he just like moves the helicopter this tall beefy man in a trench coat uh, wearing a uh, <laughs> Looks like a bowler hat or something. Just starts moves the helicopter out of the way. It starts walking toward you without saying a word. And from that point on, this guy, uh, it follows style. If you've seen that movie, just harasses you uh, throughout the entire police station. And it be, it's it's great because up until that point, you've you haven't been harassed nonstop by this like enemy that pursues you no matter where you are. Um, and you've got to know this like really tight knit space that is the police station um and well ideally you have uh, uh in in the process of solving all the puzzles which requires like you know retreading a lot of ground and so it's this perfect like game of cat and mouse where you have the advantage of knowing the police station pretty well and knowing where you need to go uh for these next like puzzle steps 
but you also now know that this guy is, is if he hears anything, he will come for you. And it's the audio is so, so good because you can always, like almost no matter where you are, hear this dude stomping around in the distance. And the directional audio is good enough that you have a general idea of where he is. And if you are too loud, um, you can hear those steps like coming closer to you. He won't always know exactly where you are, but he will know generally where the noise is. I don't know really what, what kind of programming trickery they have uh, behind Mr. X, but it is, it is, it's just like a perfect um, uh, kind of video game horror uh, scenario. And I, I don't think it was exactly that way in, in, in the original Resident Evil 2, but it's like, it's, I don't know. It's one of my favorite horror games in recent memory because of this goofy trench coat wearing bio weapon who, who pursues And when he you. catches you, he punches you in yeah. the face? Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, that's the funniest I that's part. What, I think that's what kind of amuses me the most. Like I'm used to these, I'm used to like horror bosses yeah. catching you and they like pick you up and tear you in half or ram something through your torso or... And I just I was watching a clip and he just basically just punched so punch him in the yeah. face. Like, oh. It's not even like it's not even like he winds up super hard. It's just like a very casual like sucker punch. <laughs> Almost he just walks up to you, dunk, knocks you on the ground, kind of waits for you to get up, and then resets, dunk. <laughs> it's 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 Pretty the funny. most threatening thing. Uh, all this build up and then you just get knocked on your butt. Um, so he will kill you. It, it's it's you know in the moment it's pretty so scary, but. So he doesn't kill you with one hit, but you're you're knocked down and you have to get away now. Yeah, and and it, it adds an interesting layer because up until that point, you can you know if you run into some zombies or or these liquors, these like blind, much tougher enemies, you can just like pop an arm or leg off, and they are pretty much harmless, or at least like not gonna be able to keep up with you. Um, you can fight freely, but when this guy is introduced in the equation, any noise you make, he comes running for you, and suddenly you're not just dealing with couple zombies you're dealing with a couple zombies and this guy um so anyway mr x is the whole, is the whole game set in the police station no oh, okay. uh no the, the first i don't know like I, I don't know resident evil 2 so i know it goes elsewhere um but it's like an excellent home base where a lot of action or at least early action takes place so i've been there for like five hours did some sewer stuff big alligator chased me it was great Resident Evil 2 remake, so good, so good. Um, but let's talk about uh, let's talk about Anthem. Anthem, it's it, it's Bioware's. Gosh, what term did we? Well, we didn't really decide on collectively in chat for how to describe it, but Tim Tim made it so a shared world looter shooter uh, from from the folks at Bioware um, had its VIP demo over the last weekend. Kind of opened poorly, right? Uh, we were sitting there. It was meant to happen Friday morning at 9 a.m. And no one could connect. There were people who were connecting were getting kicked or were experiencing you know, what appeared to be lag uh, or infinite loading screens, which was a common bug I, I that hit me throughout the weekend. Um, but it was our first, like, I guess, fairly big look at this game. I also went to an event and played some of the demo some of the earlier missions from the game um, that had already been covered up until that point and seen at trade shows and such, and some other stuff which I can't talk about yet. But I can, we can all sort of, we, I think we all sort of know the vague shape of what, what Anthem is supposed to be. So Jared excluded because Jared did not play it. And I think you're going to check it out this weekend, yeah? It. Yeah, and I read about it. <laughs> yeah, we, we wrote a big group impressions piece. Uh, and we'll sort of get to like our, I think the over overall sentiment we're sharing, or at least like um, PC Gamer as an editorial outlet has has landed on. But I uh, just want to know first impressions, Chris. Like after a weekend with it, what strikes you as great? What strikes you as not so great? What what are you feeling? What are you thinking? Um, <clears throat> well, generally, like I I, I enjoyed. Uh, a lot of it, I would say. I think it's a real. I think it's a nice looking game. I think the the uh, the sounds and effects and animations look great. Like I really love flying around. Um, one thing that happened as a result of these tech issues is that they unlocked all the javelins, which are your uh, you know flying suits. Um, 
Because the ranger suit, which is what you started with, I yep. wasn't super impressed with and didn't have a whole lot of fun with. Um, then I unlocked the Colossus, which I had more fun with. It's this big tanky type dude. Um, and then when they unlocked the, the rest of them, I tried out the Interceptor, which I really enjoyed, which is like uh, yeah. high speed, um, close up attacks, a lot of acrobatic stuff. Um, so I enjoyed kind of the movement. I think the I, I did have a, a bit of trouble kind of flying because I feel like the mouse controls no matter how much I come and play with them just never felt super responsive there was kind of sluggishness to kind of turning um that was kind of an issue and in terms of like missions and things like I enjoy them until the end of each mission where there'd be <laughs> like this boss fight with mobs that just kind of went on and on and I just felt like I was shooting into a pile of explosions and not yeah. being able to really tell if I was helping or not. Um, but I like I enjoyed the kind of point to point little skirmishes um, along the way. I don't know the shootings like some of the guns I felt were fun. There was a like a cool auto cannon that I liked. Um, I didn't like the shotguns at all. It felt like no, really. Bad. Like nothing was happening when I was shooting them, um, so it's kind of like a it was kind of like a mix, a kind of a mixed feelings, I guess. Um, but it was something like, as I was, as we had this period over the weekend, I would like, I would kind of jump in and play for maybe an hour and then jump out and then maybe jump back in. So it, was, it had definitely had my interest. Um, I don't know how how did you feel about the actual yeah gameplay? Uh, it's it. I'm still pretty split on it. Um... Because I think so much depends... Like, it's weird to me they didn't just have more javelins unlocked earlier. Because I think that... The the variety and, and like, the, the minor ways in which you can sort of uh, combo certain moves and that each javelin, like, is sort of dependent on. Like, the uh, uh, Storm has a lot of, like, AoE attacks and is much more about setting primers and detonating and, like, making sure the combos happen with elemental effects and, and the other classes are sort of a mix. Like the interceptor is all about melee uh, and, and speed and melee is often a detonator for this combo system. And uh, it's just like, there's a lot more, there are much more, uh, many more options for like working together or at least like, you know, playing to a role in, in, in the way that you would uh, something like uh, an MMO or, or destiny with tanks and healers and, and so on. So it's like, that was weird to me. Uh, I get, I guess they want to get people to learn like just get your feet wet with this uh, whatever the main guy is. I forget what his name is. The the, the overall uh, all around javelin. But I, I think I think the flying feels really really good. That's what stood out to me immediately. Was just like moving around as a javelin is with a mouse and keyboard feels great. The exception being close quarters flying. I think that's still it's it's gonna be a problem because the mouse is not a joystick. And unless there's like raw input for that kind of thing, which I don't, I don't know how trans, how easily that would translate from sort of how it's designed right now. But in big open spaces didn't really matter. Big combat scenarios didn't really matter to me. It felt so good to just like zip around, pop into the air, hover for a sec, seamlessly like go back to flying to move across the arena. Uh, you know, stop again, get a couple shots in like press melee to slam into the ground and yeah. you, there's so many ways to like sort of chain abilities and movement and, and, and shooting that uh, it almost doesn't matter like that. You can't read what's happening <laughs> when comp, like when combat gets going. Cause in those big, big battles, like, and that seems to be like the design principle is like around combat is like, it's more about just like, stemming the flow the constant influx of enemies because there's so many in these in these big arenas um that when you have four javelins like you know going off with their abilities which recharge really quickly shooting flying around it's it's like almost impossible to read what's going on you know and and like work together intuitively yeah um, i did like how how short the cooldowns were on yes. those abilities though like i'm used to like Using something once, I'm like, well, I'll try again in 25 minutes when the icon fills <laughs> yeah. up. Like, it was pretty quick, uh, which is great because, like, it, you know, it's fun and, like you said, you know, you want to set you want to set up uh, combos so you don't have to like because I'm terrible when something fills up and is ready to use. I'm just going to use it. Yep. Like I'm yep. not 
I'm not going to be like, well, I better wait till strategically it's the best time. I'm just going to use it immediately. So it's nice that I like I didn't screw up a mission because I popped a, a power too soon. So I kind of appreciate that. Yeah, in contrast to something like Destiny where you're, especially when it first came out, your ultimate would take a long time. Like if you used your ultimate too early or not at all, you would just like not have it the rest of the mission um, because it takes so long to build up. And here, I feel like every five minutes or whatever, if I was in the middle of combat, I was getting to do something that felt cool, whether an ultimate or, you know, those abilities take like maybe like some of them like 10 seconds to recharge and you can just go go crazy with them, uh, which I appreciate. I think like the downside for me is that like after playing the demo and going to that event, I started seeing... I don't know, like, I wish there was more to, and maybe there is in some of the later gear you get in later factions. We've only seen a couple, like, enemy factions. The Scar, I think they're called, are these, like, yeah. biotech -y, red, buggy guys. Um, and they're, I don't know, when, when you see a, a, a big uh, arena full of them, there's no real, like, besides um, the shielded enemies, there's no real, like, priority to set, you know, or, or like obvious like strategy or tactics like to take. It's just kind of like shoot into the that general direction and, and take them out and you'll probably eventually be okay. There's, you know, I wish there was something more like more of a rhythm and flow to the combat in that way. Maybe on higher difficulties, like I said, when you unlock more specific gear that is meant to specialize your role in in in, in more crafted scenarios maybe that changes but i don't know i felt like i like it was hard to distinguish one combat scenario from the next i don't know did you sort yeah. of get that vibe yeah i mean they they all felt kind of the same in a yeah. way at, at, when it's all said and done let me ask you this is it unusual for a game like this where you pick your your two weapons or whatever and then you you go on the mission and that those are like you can't pick up <laughs> something along the way and go hey i got a i got a new weapon to cycle out or like yeah is that unusual it yes yeah yeah it's unusual like destiny you can swap out i'm pretty division i'm pretty sure yeah you can swap out right yeah, you anything you want stuff. diablo yeah. you can change your whole skill tree like on the fly um because uh, i felt a little because i one time i went out i i had been kind of looking through the weapons i'd gotten and i went out with the wrong yeah the gun i didn't want to bring with me and I was like, oh, I, I guess I have to go back to the base and go back through all the loading screens and go back into my armor, which didn't seem, I mean, it's not awful. I guess it's maybe, I don't know, maybe it's good to coordinate before your mission, but if you're playing alone and you're going to team up with other people, you don't know what they're going to have or, yeah. you know, someone's going to have a sniper rifle, maybe you don't need to bring one or, I don't know. It just seemed like maybe kind of a downside to the the whole thing yeah a friendly spatula in chat says this prevents people from dicking around in their inventory in the middle of a mission it's brilliant so That's I, true. I i get yeah. i think i get that because i've definitely played destiny and i'm in a strike with some people and like tim goes quiet for like about 10 minutes and he's just sitting there <laughs> he's like tim what are you doing oh he's moving stuff around he's changing <laughs> shaders he's yeah every, every call in the division like after mission, every <clears throat> stand and go through their shoulder pads and gloves and yeah guns and check their bonuses and talents and stuff in it that is kind of a a bummer i guess i get it but also i think what overrides that problem for me is just like i i half the fun of these games for me is just like thinking around with your your character builds and and so on so i don't know i don't know stuff uh i don't think it would actually hurt that much to allow it but uh yeah um besides that i don't know like did, did you end up playing on hard or any of the higher difficulties over time um i played i played mostly on normal and hard i think i started on hard and then went okay. to normal when i was um kind of going out solo uh to mess around gotcha um were you able to like yeah, sorry go on no i was gonna ask like did you did you notice a uh big difference in the harder no well like, this is this is where i think like i think uh anthem is starting to take shape for me is it it, it uh it seems to be much more about the numbers than it is about like interesting tactical de decisions 
right? Like, um, I, I can't, I don't know. Again, like, I got to see what kind of late game gear there is and late game abilities and stuff that really sort of change up or don't uh, the roles you play in combat. But, but like, the differences between difficulties, and I talked to uh, Mike Gamble about this, is is just scaling it's more enemies higher constitution for the enemies they do more damage and vice you know it, it scales very li- in a very linear fashion which mm-hmm. means to me like the combat will or excuse me like progression and playing on higher difficulties it will it will be all about the loop of getting better gear to make hard feel like normal and then to get better enough gear on hard to make hard feel or excuse me, to, to make the next difficulty feel like hard and so on. So it's, right. it's much more of like a Diablo because Diablo eventually is very difficult, but for the bulk of its of hard and insane and, and Inferno level one and two and three or whatever it is, like it sort of feels the same because you're getting gear that takes you through those those uh, those uh, difficulty changes pretty naturally rather than through like testing you in, in interesting ways. So I don't know, like... It's gonna, I think, really depend on how interesting the the guns you're getting are and the abilities you're getting are. Did you feel like you picked up anything that was felt unique or different, uh, weapon wise or ability wise? In, in... Um, no, I mean it just felt like I had a, you know, a level ten <laughs> machine gun, and then I got a level twelve machine gun. Like yeah. I didn't didn't particularly feel like the loot i got was was amazing or anything like that um yeah i mean i i didn't really unlock a whole lot of stuff so yeah and it it was like maybe a five level there's 30 levels total and we like the the demo is five levels in the middle of the campaign somewhere set in the middle of the campaign so it's really kind of hard to hard to gauge um what kind of spread of, of abilities and weapons we'll get um, but I, yeah. I just really hope it feels more diverse over time or, or gets a little experimental and weird. Because even the Division, which I think is similarly like a more of a numbers uh, game, you know, you're not getting gear and stuff that makes you look insanely different or cool or whatever. But um, you're mostly fi- like playing to get gear that fits a specific broken build or has rolls a certain stat that uh, changes this stat or co- or has an interesting synergy with this ability um, stuff that's sort of all behind the scenes that you don't necessarily like feel or see when you're playing, but that math nerds and the, like super Diablo nerds and uh, will love to like min max and play around with. Um, so I don't know, like if anything, well, I actually, I do want to ask this cause like that stuff, that stuff we'll, we'll all find out once it's out, how it sort of uh, articulates. But I, I want to know, like, did the writing grab you at all? This is Bioware we're talking about. Any of the storytelling just hook you? Um, I, I mean, there was one interesting story beat or occurrence. Yeah. Um, I didn't I didn't really... I was, I was wanting to fly around. I wasn't wanting yeah. to listen to the story. Although I... And especially from the, like the middle like i, I want to know like i want to start the story at the beginning i was like i don't want to really hear because you go on these missions and people are like oh it's a such and such we need to this is what i would recommend using the blah 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 i'm like i don't know what those things mean at this point <laughs> and i don't want to like and i'm curious like i want to know what are you talking about so like for the stories like i want to start at the beginning and like no like i'm not even sure what the hell we're doing there like no. to be honest and so I didn't really pay much attention to the story. Um, you know, if you're going to give the benefit of the doubt to, you know, dialogue, I think Bioware is a good place to to do that. Um, it seemed fine. I mean, the conversation seemed fine. The characters uh, that I talked to didn't particularly annoy me. Um, they seemed okay. That's ringing um, praise. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, it's like all I wanted to do. It's so. It was so funny because with all these problems of like restarting over and over and it starts you in this part of the fort and you got to walk really slowly yeah. to get to that. Like, I just want to get in the armor and fly around. Um, so like anyone that needs to talk to me along the way to my armor, just shut up. I just want to skip whatever <laughs> you're saying. 
especially because, like I said, I want to. I would like to to start from the beginning and get all the information. Um, so yeah, I can't really can't really judge the the story from what I saw. But yeah, hard to say. I think like some of those characters could be interesting over time. Uh, but again, there were so many terms like the amulet and the the echo s- echo and the centrifugal blah blah. I don't know. Like none of it. The none of it made sense. Um, I don't expect it to until I play. I some of the characters really annoyed me, but I think that's because I've never we've never played a Bioware game where. And and I by a Bioware game I'm referencing like Mass Effect and Drag the last couple of Dragon Ages, uh, where the characters. <laughs> They're not quite cartoonish, but they're a little overdone. You know, they're a little intentionally um, uh, melodramatic in in their beats and and, and so on, uh, with some exceptions. But now we're getting these (laughs) these Bioware character performances, like first person in our face, where they don't break eye contact. And every, like, wry joke that a Bioware character typically makes, uh, because... They love their jokes. It feels like flirtation. It's it's just like a little too intimate to me. <laughs> like uh, I, don't, I don't know the first person in a Bioware game. I just I, I feel like I feel like I'm being harassed by all these. I'm walking around Fort Tarsus and I can't like get across the you know the plaza without six people going. What's up? Hey, freelancer, how are you? I'm just like trying to keep my head down. It's a little much, but hey, you know maybe I'll I'll, I'll I won't mind. When I get to know them from the beginning. Uh, Their future romance options for you, James. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing is like they've said there's no romance options yet. They're they're you know they are open to adding them in the long term support, but every single one of those characters feels like it's fl- they're flirting with you. <laughs> it's the way they get right up in your grill. Um, but yeah, Anthem. You know, it's in our many conversations about it over the last week. Uh, or since since it came out, uh, the demo came out. It's I I don't feel like I know any more about it, even though I've played it for like t- whatever ten hours at this point. I feel like I don't know any more about it than I did before playing it. Other than it feels good to fly, the combat I have I have a lot of doubts about. Otherwise, I just want to know. I think from the beginning, the big question has always been like, is the world going to be interesting, and is the story going to grab me, and the rest like is icing on the cake you know if, if it's a cool loot game that i want to keep playing over and over cool but i don't know we'll see maybe we're maybe we're looking for too much or looking yeah. for things that aren't there um i don't know you know it's it was a very small slice of something yeah. that it's uh i guess we'll maybe we might just have to wait until the whole shebang is out before we really know yeah much and that is happening. Well, there's another demo, the public demo, this weekend. I think Friday through Sunday. Um, and then the 14th or the 15th, It's if you're an Origin Premier, is that what the top tier is called, member, then you get to play the full game like a week or so before it's out. So, Mito, maybe? We'll find out soon enough. I hope it's a smooth launch. And I hope there's a lot to like in there. We'll find out soon. Um, and we'll have more to say about that, I think, once we play this weekend and uh, actually get our hands on the full thing. And I'll have something something else to say about it soon, but I can't talk about it yet. Um, let's move on. Yay. Let's move on to... Uh, <laughs> there's no... There's no there's, yeah, graphics. Let's move on to graphics. There's no clean segue there. Jared, sing us the anthem... Of the RTX 2060. Oh, behold the RTX 2060. How I love you. What Um, is this? So, you know, the RTX 60, it's, this is the weird thing. Like on one level, you're like, okay, if Nvidia had launched with the RTX 2060, but called it the RTX 2070 and the 2070 was the 2080 and, and so on. Right. Like, would it have been received better with, uh, if, if the pricing were better? And honestly, I don't think it really would have mattered much because without the games utilizing the new features, like, it's this chicken and egg scenario where everyone's like, hey, sweet, we've got new features that nothing uses. And I honestly was 
almost sure we would have like patches for Shadow of the Tomb Raider um, last November, maybe December, mm -hmm. you know, and it's still plugging along, nothing. So there's rumors that Metro Exodus, which maybe we should save that segue for later, but that's <laughs> supposed to that's supposed to actually have the DXR, the DirectX ray tracing and RTX effects um, available at launch, oh, which okay. like they've, they've tweeted this and I'm like a total skeptic. I'm like, I will believe it when I see it because, you know, Battlefield came out with RTX, what, a week after it launched, but performance was really bad. And so it was like three weeks later, they released the first patch that improved things um, I think they did another patch that improved, improved them maybe even a bit more. And now they've, they're still working on a DLSS patch, which uh, DLSS, for those who haven't been following the hardware side, that's the deep learning super sampling, which is a fancy way of saying it's using the AI um, tensor cores that are built into Turing architecture to do um, upscaling of your screen resolution. Well, not... Uh, so it's actually half your screen resolution in pixels. So it's a weird number. So huh, it's okay. it's not like half of 1920, so like uh, 960 by 540. It's not that, because that would be one quarter of the resolution. It's, right. But it's half the resolution, so like 1.4, mm -hmm. you know, square root of two thing. Um, but there is there is a game that has DLSS enabled yeah. already, and that's Final Fantasy 15. Um which is, this is like, it's the worst scenario for launching these new features, I feel, because <laughs> Battlefield Five launches with DirectX ray tracing and everyone's like, oh, here's their first test. And it's like the worst case where it's only reflections. It's in a game that's predominantly multiplayer. And it's like, no one's going to take the 50% performance hit in a multiplayer game, are they? No. Not, not like anyone who plays a lot. I will, because all I do is benchmark, really. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, no, but... So, so that was bad. Well, Final Fantasy XV brings DLSS, and it only supports it if you're using a 4K display. So you can't use it at 1440 or 1080p. And it's like, well, like, why not? Like, how, how hard could that have been? But, uh, um, and then I, I did screenshot comparisons and stuff and right. looked at too. If you're playing Final Fantasy XV with DLSS, like, you probably won't really notice it. Because you're just like, oh yeah, I'm playing the game. But if you start comparing screenshots, it adds a lot of blurriness. I'm like, well, yeah, great. You know, a blur filter is a great way of eliminating anti-aliasing. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I have hope that things get better. Um, I've heard that NVIDIA is trying to encourage future ray tracing games to support DLSS from the get-go. Because basically it's like, well, you take 1080p. You turn on ray tracing, you lose half your performance, and then you turn on DLSS and you gain the performance back. And I'm like, well, okay, that's that's one way of doing it, but you know, then you're really not rendering at 1080p or 1440p or whatever. So, um, but the, the RTX 2060 it, it performs well. You know, it's uh, in all of the benchmarks I ran, which was 17 games. You know, you know that's a that's a huge collection. I could probably test five and get a similar number, but. Uh, Across all 17 games, I think it beat the 1070 in every single game, which cool. is good. Um, and it beat the 1070 Ti in a few games and lost in a few games and basically ends up being um, almost identical performance in the existing games to the 1070 Ti. Gotcha. And it's theoretically $100 cheaper than the 1070 Ti, but the 1070 Ti, there was a lot of them available <laughs> at the end. And so the price is basically the same as the 1070 Ti. So um, ray tracing performance, I did see a few things where like ray tracing likes a lot of VRAM and memory bandwidth. So being a six gig card instead of an eight gig or 11 gig card does seem to affect performance more um, as you as you tax the card. Like it's not a card for 4K ray tracing at all. Uh, I believe the the Port Royal 3D Mark um, benchmark, which is also ray tracing and actually looks a lot cooler than Battlefield 5. Um, but at 4K, the 2060 plugs along at like four frames per second, 
or two frames per second. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> whereas, whereas like, and, and to put, yeah. put that in perspective, the 2070, a car that's nominally 25% faster or 20% faster, yeah. because it has more memory, the 2070 was like almost an order of magnitude faster at 4K. So, you know, it was like the 2060 ran out of memory and just choked at 4K ah. in port route. So that was kind of interesting. But, I mean, overall, it's like... Ray tracing is this high-end feature, really, and deservedly so for now. And we're talking about a mid-range or at least lower high-end car, 350. I'm like, man, it's it's going to be hard to see that running the first generation of ray tracing games at good performance. I think it will be. I think I think with DLSS, I think 1080p ray tracing will be viable, but that's probably it. So, okay. Um, so there, you, I mean, RTX 2060, it's, it's a good card. I, I think I scored it. A, I don't even remember my score now. Uh, 87. I linked it in chat. Oh, good. 88. 88. 88. Cause eights were cool. Um, hardware scores are such a pain in the rear. Cause you're like, well, I scored this card, this thing, and this is a better card. Shouldn't it be higher? Um, so the 2060, like, I don't think they can go below it on ray tracing, right? Like, justifiably, no. there is no 2050. And the rumors are that we're getting the 1660 Ti and the 1660 um, that will bring back GTX branding. So oh, interesting. <laughs> and the last uh, well, Yeah. Well, so what we don't know is, will the GTX 1660 Ti, will it basically be the 2060 with ray tracing turned on meaning mm. like same chip but they they said well some of the rt cores were dysfunctional so we're just going to sell it or is it a completely separate architecture and i mean we don't know nvidia hasn't said there's there's supposed leaks and i mean i always take the leaks with a grain of salt so um nvidia hasn't told me anything so we we will see but there there are a few leak benchmarks saying the 1660 is coming and will not have ray tracing mm. um should we talk about the other graphics card that's coming? If you got something to say about it, because I'm curious, what can you say? Uh, well, so Radeon 7. AMD announced it. It's the VII Roman numerals, so it's like Vega 2. Okay. Um, it's the first 7 nanometer GPU out there, which is pretty cool. Um, that's a, Why is that cool? Well, so every time you shrink, like you get more transistors in um, okay. in a smaller space. So... I, I don't have the exact numbers here, but I, I think the Vega chip, the GPU was like 495 millimeters squared. And then you had two HBM2 stacks so that, you know, the whole chip, I, I have a chip somewhere, but I can't find it right now. Uh, it was a pretty beefy chip. And that means it's expensive to manufacture. Well, Vega 2 is basically more transistors. It's like a billion more transistors, 13.5 instead of 12.5. And the die size shrank from 490 down to like 330, they said. So, you know, that's basically you you just shrink the, the size of your chip. That means you get more chips per wafer um, and performance should be better. But the problem is like I'm I'm really having a hard time finding how finding out how or not finding out, but determining in my head, like who's going to buy this Radeon 7 because it costs the same as on RTX 2080. And even though it has twice as much memory, it doesn't have any of the ray tracing features. And by AMD's own numbers, they say, well, it's about 30% 30, 30 faster than a Vega 64, mm -hmm. which, and then they say, and it's, it's on parity with an RTX 2080. I'm like, well, my numbers have the <laughs> RTX 2080 beating the Vega 64 by 45%. Um, Math is off there. <laughs> yeah, so like, so like AMD's maybe cherry picking their benchmarks a okay. bit, which um, every company does. Sure. So, so yeah, it's like if if it costs as much as a twenty eighty and is provably slower in most games, like that's and a no non ray tracing. <laughs> yeah, and, like even if you don't care about ray right. tracing now, it's like, well, hey, do you want to pay seven hundred dollars for something that might be usable in the future or something that? is slower and doesn't have any chance of doing ray tracing. Mm. I'm like, well, that's, that's a pretty easy one. So 
but the card is here. I the card arrived today. I cannot show you pictures, even though and AMD already did their whole launch at right. CES and showed the card off. I, I asked them, I'm like, are you serious? Like, I can't. They're like, no, February fourth, you can show unboxing or whatever. I'm like, because we've already seen the card. Like, people were handling it. They were showing it at CES. Um, but I guess they they don't want people like ripping off the covers and the shrouds and dismantling the card early like sure. i guess control you know, the message not, up until the uh, yeah. very last second it's like that's not something pc gamer usually does to hardware because that's no. not our audience but uh you know if you can be the first one to put a youtube video up showing the card dismantled maybe you'll get some views i don't know so the mm. launch is on february 7th and we'll have I'll have benchmarks and review information then. Um, I mean, I, I hope it does better than I'm expecting. I, I'm, I'm seriously skeptical because the price is just, it's it's painful. I'm like, it's it's RTX all over again without ray tracing at all. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah. It's not a great we'll see. Pitch for an upgrade. <laughs> and I'm well, sitting here, I'm sitting here, I'm like dying. I want to upgrade my car, Jared, so bad. My 980 Ti at 1440, not working for me. And there's yeah. no like clear, like obvious answer that won't literally empty my bank account. So I'm impatient. I'm just getting impatient here. I'm tired of all these. Well, just hang on, and I should be able to send a card your way. I hope. Oh, it's okay, Jared. I know um, you're literally swimming in them, but it's okay. Um, cool. Not the RTX cards. The only thing I've got is like MSI's oh. cards, basically, because so I do their performance analysis articles, right? So. Well, swimming in MSIs. That's okay. I don't need I don't need ray tracing yet. Who does? Not me. Uh, Chris does. Yeah. For volcano explosions. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but l- let's move on to our final topic, which is I don't know. People are treating like a terrible volcanic explosion that is uh, going to slowly wipe out all of Earth. Um, now there's a good segue. That's. <laughs> It's okay. Sweet. I'm getting there. I don't think I'm made for this kind of thing. Uh, unless you've been living under a rock, and even if you have, you probably know that Epic has opened their own digital storefront, and they've sort of secured some exclusives uh, right out of the gate with uh, a bunch of games. And by ex- exclusive, we mean digital exclusive. Uh, this is not a thing that's really... We, we haven't seen a lot of, um, at least since Steam sort of became the you know sort of the unspoken destination for pc gaming um but yeah epic is you know with all that fortnite money they've got a storefront going they're uh securing exclusives uh they have free games every two weeks uh that you can keep permanently so clearly they have a lot of money and muscle to be able to sort of plant a flag and and stake a claim in in a space that has been largely uncontested not totally uncontested. Um, it's not like Steam is like a, an absolute monopoly or anything, and, and there's certainly been a lot of debate over what the hell that <laughs> that means in Reddit, uh, and Twitter, and elsewhere. But um, Epic is is trying to become a, a destination uh, like Steam for digital games. And and <laughs> gosh, was it Monday? God, it feels like a lifetime ago that <laughs> Epic. Uh, excuse me. It was announced via <laughs> via the Steam page for Metro Exodus that Metro Exodus would no longer be purchasable um, after a certain point on Steam's platform. It would be exclusive to Epic's digital platform um, for one year. I think it's just one year, right? And then and then it will be back on Steam. Uh, yeah. You know, some caveats: all pre-orders on Steam will be honored. And you saw it like rock it up while it was still purchasable, like to the, the top seller because people love Steam. And, you know, that's where they love their library to exist, and that's totally fine. Um, but on, on Epic's launcher, it's, it's I think, 10 bucks cheaper, at least in uh, North American territories. I know that like Epic's launcher does not have regional pricing in the same way that Steam does. Um, so some people are getting the shaft in terms of pricing. Um, don't know what to say about that. But this is this has made a lot of people mad, um, and <laughs> I want to know if this anger, which is mostly directed at Epic, from what I can tell, 
is justified. What do you guys think about this, this situation overall? Is sneaking an exclusive, what, two weeks before it, it comes out, maybe three weeks before it comes out? Um, yeah, when know? it's basically, I mean, it, it, very strange situation. It's been, it's been so weird. You could pre order it pre-ordered on steam for i don't know how many months now it's basically yeah. been there as a big you know uh advertisement yeah. for like hey yeah. metro exodus and then for them to go with epic as an exclusive for a year mm -hmm. in some cases at a lower price and even like we even saw valve be like yeah like actually say something actually valve actually said something which is very unusual and they're not too demonstrative usually um and just weird for like i guess for for metro to like on their steam page announce that we're not on it was just a weird Very it was weird. a weird day um yeah so yeah i i get people not being super happy um i guess i don't know if it's i mean if you bought it on steam you'll still be able to play it'll still get updated it's not a multiplayer game so it's not something you'll need your friends around for um so at least I guess you're taken care of. You're okay, um, but I know people are very resistant to, you know, yet another launcher, yet another storefront, and that, as far as I can tell, like has no features. I mean, what does the Epic launcher do? You you can buy a game it. and launch it. Right? Um, so it's severely yeah. lacking in features right now. I mean, like uh, one of my big beefs is, and Steam does as well. Origin now does it. UPlay does it. GOG does it. Um, there's two platforms that don't do it properly, and that's if I download a big game that's 50 or 100 gigabytes, I don't want to download that a second time to test it on a second PC. Um, with Windows Store, there's no way to migrate that over that I found. Mm -hmm. And uh, with Fortnite, I tested that on some systems, and I had to download that on every one. I tried copying over the files, and like Epic's launcher, like it would not verify the files and just go, oh, yeah, look, I can see all the... Yeah. And it should... It, like it should be a really easy fix because it doesn't look like Windows Store basically encrypts everything and locks it to the computer and it's it's horrible, but uh, like it's annoying. Um, but I mean, I don't care about what store things are on that much. Um, I just think it's weird. Like I understand what Epic's doing, but I'm like, shouldn't you have a good storefront before you go procuring the, like these big exclusives? Yeah, I think I think that's like. If we if we remove ourselves from I think Metro is being used as uh, I think it's it's a pretty poor like example to stand behind in terms of like how like what Epic is really trying to do I think it is a very very messy shitty last second defection overall um, and as as Evan here says in chat the argument is that they use Steam as a storefront window then use that storefront window to say you can't buy it here you can only buy it on Epic and that's that doesn't. That's not cool. That's like you know, go into the horse saddle store and put in an order for a horse saddle, and then being told that it's been you know you have to go to JP Leather Co. across town. <laughs> this is the fucking no awful example <laughs> to pick up your saddle, and you know that requires interfacing with different people and giving your money to support a different company that you maybe know have you know principally stand behind, um, but. If we remove ourselves from this messy last second, it, thanks Evan. Now it's last second exchange. Uh, I don't think like Epic buying exclusives is 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 an end of the world, end of PC gaming as we know it scenario. I think it if we like re remove ourselves from the hubbub of right now and say like how does this actually affect players. Um, it, it requires them to, you know, agree to a, a EULA, you know, that they maybe don't agree with. Um, maybe that's like the worst case and they are no longer like principally allowed to purchase games on, on the Epic Store. But, you know, we all agree to EULAs we don't read and terms of service we don't read. Um, I, don't, I don't know that long term this is really going to change or, or truly like affect uh the the ecosystem uh of, of 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 how we play uh other than we have to go to a different place to buy some things um i don't think steam's going anywhere 
Epic is clearly not. And for anyone to, I think, discount like Epic's play here is they're going to be around. There's so many people playing Fortnite and there are so many kids who, I mean, like the only reason I'm into Steam and like like Steam and have a library on Steam is because I played Half-Life 2 a long time ago. And that became just a, a platform I had to open up to play the games I liked, which then exposed me to the store and, and so on and so forth. And that's happening to an entire generation of these these Fortnite kits. And I think, you know, if, if Epic is correct and uh, uh, isn't outright evil, um, all companies are evil, all money is evil, then I think they're going to be around. And I think that is, in the end, a good thing for Steam and a good thing for Epic and a good thing for all games hopefully i don't know it, it, i don't think it yeah, is i mean like we you know theoretically you can buy you play games off of steam but yeah. who does that because all you do is then it opens up you play for you right and you're like oh great so now i have to launch it in steam and then it launches you play so effectively you play games are on you know ubisoft games are on you play uh ea already ditched steam quite a few years back and created their EA Origin, which I mean, it, it kind of it kind of sucked early on, um, and it's gotten okay. But I only use it for EA games. You know, the only real competitors right now to Steam are GOG and like who? Uh, who else competes with Steam directly as like a universal platform? I guess itch.io maybe. Um, but so you know, all of the big companies are creating their own launchers, and they don't want to pay. 20 or 30 percent to steam if they don't have to but mm -hmm. I, it's that's that's a business question like are they losing more sales than they're making up for in the in the profit so i don't know i, I think i think it's a smart play because like really if you think about it epic was only the unreal and unreal engine guys until fortnite yeah like yeah. they they were going nowhere fortnite was a complete failure before they made Battle Royale. What a weird couple of years it's been. Yeah. Uh, uh, like Whiplash. Crazy. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, we've got billions of dollars in the bank that we can throw at these problems. And, and I mean, you know, what does, uh, Valve doesn't make games either, right? They just make Steam. <laughs> and then they buy companies who make games that they want to, to procure rights to. Like They say they're making games again. They made they, Artifacts, they which is a game, to be fair. Right. Um, but yeah, it's obviously they're they're juggling quite a bit of responsibility. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like Valve has turned into this company that they've spent so much time worrying about their platform that they've forgotten, and they're realizing like, oh yeah, we should go back and make games again. Like, there's got to be people at that company who are just like, hey, I'm really tired of doing IT programming on the back end of Steam. Like, I signed on to make games, not not <laughs> Steam. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I think uh, you know. I think. I think we we want um, overall we want someone competing with Steam, and I don't think even if I don't think it's enough to have like a decent client with some features. I think you have if you're going to compete, you have to do something dramatic, and I think that's what Epic is doing something really dramatic. Probably, yeah, it's it's going to make some people very unhappy and make some waves, but like. You need a real incentive to leave Steam. It can't be like, oh, here's another storefront with a good client with a friends list. Well, it's still no incentive to, to not get something on Steam. So I think Epic realizes this and they got to do some real dramatic stuff. And yep. that's kind of what they're doing. And I think, like, I, I get people are unhappy, but I think, I think eventually once there's a, a real, you know, competitor out there, I think, I think it'll probably be better overall for for customers. I think I think before you can get customers, you have to get the publishers and developers. And look at it this way: how many you know how many other launchers did Epic just totally erase because yeah. now publishers are going to go with them? I mean, you know, did you want a Deep Silver uh, launcher? No, probably nice. not. But um, maybe maybe it'll prevent every publisher from coming up with their own launcher and maybe this will be hopefully someday when they've got some features and things settle down a little and there's not this exclusive situation happening yeah um, hopefully it'll come out in our benefit with having options and having 
hopefully they'll start fighting with discounts instead of exclusives. Yes. Um, so, I mean, when you think about it, like 4A and Metro Exodus, it's like, man, this it's a weird thing. But at the same time, I like they were I imagine Metro Exodus was already going to be a successful game. Like it's hard to imagine it not making the money they spent back because the last two games did fairly well. Right. But it's like basically Epic just went, hey, we just cut you a check that I mean, who knows how much they paid, but I, I feel like it had to be tens of millions probably to ditch steam i'm like that that's huge like <laughs> that's two fortnite skins in epic terms uh, yeah but no you're right and and i think like b- epic won't be able to won't be I, I i can't imagine they'll be cutting checks like that all yeah. forever into eternity um because eventually they'll have just a a library and and uh regular users and and you know it, a, a more features and so on and then once things settle down the ideal situation is is steam and epic are on relatively equal ground and publishers and developers will then have the option to say which place if not both makes more sense for me and man, many times i think it will be both platforms and many times it it you know in the end this is not going to consume uh, I can't imagine it consuming and, and, and like taking every game that comes out forever and ever hostage uh, or, no. or, or Epic securing exclusive rights into, you know, 30 years from now for, for every AAA game because I don't know, like, I, I don't know if Fortnite will always be printing money like that and, you know, Valve might come up with their own new way to print money that gives them the edge over Epic. It, it's, it's always going to be this, this back and forth but ideally, when things are, are relatively calm, it's going to be another option for uh, uh, developers and, and players that uh, that are constantly evolving to, to best one another feature-wise and usability-wise yeah. rather than with money and library-wise. <laughs> That's what you I know. If, if, if I tie it back into hardware, like there's people who get really down on Intel and NVIDIA for being so big and controlling, you know, they throw their weight around and everyone's ticked off at NVIDIA's RTX launch because NVIDIA looked at the numbers and said, hey, we have no competition. We can do this. We can raise the price, whatever. Um, Steam had no real good competition here. And I think that 30% royalty, that's that's a lot. That's and maybe change. it was, yeah, it's, it's like it was probably worthwhile earlier on. But now when Steam's got 35,000 or whatever games on there, I'm like, I, I don't feel like, I don't feel like they're earning their keep for most of the the people who put games on there. Maybe they are, but I I like the idea of another competitor that could do something more and you know bring bring the price down, hopefully, or at least get the developers more money so that developers don't fold. Yeah, in the end, we want our developers to be okay uh, before anything yeah. else. But, at least uh, the good ones. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys do, do in closing? Do you guys think this is going to change PC gaming as a whole? I mean, we, we've known it to be Steam and and you know third-party stores and some smaller launchers for a while now. Um, is Epic gonna sort of over the course of a generation become become a big player? Is that gonna affect you? Uh, you know, we'll we'll see. Like, I think we we kind of agree. Like, um, they kind of took a it was kind of a weird step to get all these exclusives before developing like a decent, yeah, uh, you know, store with more features. Um, it, it would have been great if they'd had a bit more to present um, in terms of what kind of client it is before kind of doing all this. <clears throat> so I think it kind of depends if if they can produce something relatively quickly. I would say that that adds some features that that make customers, you know have a use for it beyond just well this is the only place i could buy it so i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna have to do it or or i'm not gonna do it at all um so i guess i don't know i i can't really predict we'll see they certainly can stuff a lot of new stuff into fortnite every week maybe they can maybe their their client developers can can stuff a lot of cool stuff into their launcher hopefully hopefully
Yeah, I mean, long term, like it, it doesn't bother me one way or another. I'm like, you know, it could become the de facto way of the future, or Steam could remain there, or they could become equal competitors. I'm like, our computers are fast enough and everything that I'm not too worried about like one more application sitting there. Um, I've already had to suffer through a lot of launchers that aren't necessarily better than Steam, but you use them because you have to, and you know it doesn't. Every time I launch Origin, it's not like it's killing me. I'm just like, no, oh, I want to go play, uh, you know, Battlefield or whatever, and it's it's fine. Remember so. when you play uh, and Origin were unthinkable evils <laughs> in our lives? I don't know. Maybe we're just. I would say the, big, the biggest crime. The biggest crime started, and it doesn't have my password auto filled in there. Oh. That's my biggest, because, like, you play to do it all the time, Origins do it all the time. And I got to say, I, I started up Epic the other day, and it didn't have my password in there, and I was like, Ooh. fuck you. Achilles heel. You just made Damn. an enemy. No. Um, you know, like, I think there's a lot of Fortnite password hacking attempts, too. <laughs> great. Yeah, that's, I mean, Epic's got to lock down their security, too. I think we've, there, there have been a couple uh, stories over the past, maybe just because Fortnite's been in the spotlight of hacked yeah. accounts and such, but... Uh, well, I mean, like, I, I don't even use my Fortnite account that much. And I've gotten things where it's like, hey, you need to reset your password, like, twice now in the last year. I'm like, I hadn't even played for six months. And also, it's like, hey, you need to reset your password. I'm like, what? Like, yeah. what's going on over there? Yeah. Steam, I think I've had the same password for <laughs> three or four years. <laughs> there you go, everybody. Go, go. Uh, that's, that's like uh, an open call to hack that. No, don't. Don't, don't hack Jerry's team. But uh, oh, Evan in chat says, anyone else remember like having 20 game icons and folders on their desktop in Windows 95? I actually like, yeah, that was a simultaneous nightmare, but I I made some weird, weird uh, arrangements and little, uh, had, had my own logic, sometimes based on color, sometimes based on icon shape, genre. Um, I would install things like, Oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it. But there was like a custom desktop tools where you could uh, in, uh, create custom elements, and, and I would do some fun stuff with that. And less so, I, my desktop these days is uh, a dumping ground for temporary files and temporary work. It's or in nice pictures. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's uh, these next couple of years are going to certainly be fun <laughs> from a spectator standpoint, and I'm curious, like what the hell the next exclusive is going to be because this this exclusive thing is is not done with i think epic still needs to in their eyes secure a stronger base of uh, uh of, a stronger library to to draw more people over but i'll tell you what epic really needs is cloud saves yeah i think well i think that's happening soon <laughs> it, it should be happening at the end of this month or the next month if i'm remembering correctly but that's a bonkers one yeah Maybe it can be a, a weekly timed mode where you get cloud saves as a feature for two weeks. <laughs> there you go. Temporary cloud mode. Play according to the lunar cycle. Um, but let, let's let's move on to uh, listener Q and A. Uh, listener Q and A is where we answer your questions from chat in our PC Gamer Club Discord. If you are asking questions in Twitch chat, please tag PC Gamer in your question. Otherwise. It, I just won't see it. Um, but we do prioritize questions from the PC Gamer Club. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go to club.pcgamer.com to find out more. It's just a small subscription service um, that gets you an ad-free experience on the site, free game each month. Invite to our private Discord where Apollo will just troll your taste um, eternally, forever and ever, amen. Uh, you get a digital subscription to our magazine uh, the RPG handbook, a digital version of that, um, and some other little goodies as we, as we get them. You also get to hang out with me. You have a direct line to bothering me while I'm trying to work. So think about that. Think about that. Doesn't that sound great? Um, let's ask our first question here. And Nick Manley, back to Anthem. How does Anthem compare and contrast to Destiny 2? And I'll answer this one real quick because uh, I've played a lot of Destiny 2, but... I think it is more like the Destiny comparisons come easily because it's this sci fi fantasy setting. Uh, but structurally, I think it's going to, or over time as a whole, it's going to feel a lot different than Destiny. Um, like I said earlier, 
I think I think Anthem is going to be more about the gear grind than it is working towards something like Destiny's raids, these big end game challenges. I know I know Anthem will have big end game challenges, but until we see like something that meets the quality and complexity of of a raid from Bungie, um, then it's hard for me to like it's hard for me to believe it's it's going to match up. I think Anthem will be more about broken builds. Uh, there's no PvP, so it doesn't have to be balanced for both. Uh, it is just going to be about finding the gear and weapons that create the ultimate, the best synergies possible between you, or internally, intrinsically, in, within your build and among your teammates, that makes the numbers go super high super quickly. Uh, and that will be the payoff in the end game, I think. That's, that's what, the, at least from what I've played, seems to be the incentive. Um, other than that, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of differences. So uh, I think we'll find out as soon as it uh, is live. Um, next question. Uh, Jules. Obviously, there will be some epic Steam talk over Metro Exodus, but my question is, what's a feature you'd like to see from the epic launcher that you don't see on Steam that could maybe lead to major changes? So what can epic do that Steam is not doing to you know really, really uh, justify the existence of their store? Not that it needs it, really, but, you know, anything you're craving, feature-wise. Just update itself without telling me, like, you're... <laughs> no, that's terrible. I do like to know when things get updated. But I feel like every time I log into downloading an update, I'm like, just do it, just do it, you know? Yep. yep. Keeping the loop. For me... Um, no, what would be a good feature? What is Steam lacking? Uh, I mean, like, it, it, I, I hate saying it, but it, because I think they announced this on the way this year, it's just better library management, like, out of the gate. I just want to be able to curate my own collections a lot easier and and, and have, like, more access to metadata in, in ter- sorting in the library. Um, that is both maybe, like, drawn in from a... A tagging system that actually makes fucking sense. Steam's community tagging system is a nightmare. Um, and yeah, just a bit like better curation out of the gate, I think will, uh, and it, it, it's too small to really face that problem or need to face that problem yet. But I think just like set the, set the building blocks for good library management at now. Do it now. <laughs> Cause what they have there is like really simple at the moment um, and doesn't give me much hope. Yeah, it's funny. I'm like, are there any features that the Epic Store currently has that I mean, like, that Steam doesn't do better? Like, that's the that's the problem. Like, it's right now, it's all on Steam. Like, it's like, well, Steam does this, and then, you know, they they support moving your files around hard drives easily. They support, you know, your um, your cloud saves and all these other features. And I'm like, yeah, Epic needs to do a lot. But the things that I I would like to see from epic i mean yeah it's all library management stuff needs to be like i would i would like better recommendations than steam gives me um maybe steam's getting better but i don't know maybe we could have free games (laughs) we could every user gets assigned their own uh personal curator who as soon as you log on, you get a little message in the corner. It says, hey, James, how can I help you today? And it's a real person <laughs> for every user. What are you in the mood for? Do you need someone to play with? So just like a butler. How about a, they got a lot of money. Sounds so. a bit creepy to me. But... Sounds pretty Cortana. normal. Cortana. Pretty normal. Yeah, uh, Cortana, but a human. Um, good question, Jules. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, Grim Apollo sort of on the other side of the spectrum here. What third party game do you think will you what third party game do you want to be Valve's first paid Steam exclu- exclusive? So what's how does Valve Valve clap back? And they they, uh, clap they back pay with? someone they pay someone really good to make Half-Life 3. <laughs> they go third party with it? They should cuz they clear I mean like they haven't done it for so long. I'm like just just like pay someone to do it like You've got the money. You know, it, it, this might be the straw that broke the camel's back, and they might be like, oh, shit, we got we to gotta make Half-Life 3 now. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't I don't think they really need to be that worried, but if they were going to clap back, that would be a hell of a move. As far as games they would buy out from under Epic. I mean, they could feasibly, right? Buy buy Metro Exodus back. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Just ping pong it for a while. That'd be really um, that'd be funny. I don't expect them to to buy exclusives because no. then, that would turn the critics that would you know make them uh equal in, in terms of of moral and and judgment on epics you know the crazy thing is that epic basically has made their money off of a free-to-play game right yeah. you know so it's like everyone is looking at that huge piece of pie and going man how do we get that how do we how do we create a game that gets 140 million people that then want to pay 20 dollars for a skin um but, you know, I, I think there's an inherently limited market for that. Yeah. Yeah. Rakesh44 says Cyberpunk exclusive. They would need a lot of money. <laughs> I, think, I don't think CD Projekt needs to, needs to you know, go to the prom with anyone. They, they, they can go by themselves and be just fine. Unless that game sucks. Maybe it'll suck. Uh, let's see other questions. I'm not seeing any other questions unless no one tagged me. Now's your chance, people. Now's your chance. If you have any questions, we got time for like maybe one or two more. Tag PC Gamer in the chat. Um, if not, let me check our Discord one more time. If we don't get anything soon, we'll just uh, we'll just put a pin in it. We'll put a pin in it. Discord. Here we go. <laughs> that's a good one, Evan. What <laughs> game will be the best game on February 15? I'm forgetting everything that's coming out, but we have an article yeah, to we... pull up. Feb 15. Whoops. Here we go. So, uh, February 15th, Far Cry New Dawn coming out. Metro Exodus. Crackdown 3. Gosh, I keep forgetting that's happening. Jump Force. And Anthem's uh, origin premiere launch. Of so those. what's going to be the best out yeah, of all? Yeah, what's going to be the best? Hmm. I don't know. Um. I might. I might. I, I kind of think Far Cry New Dawn could be kind of great because, kind of the post-apocalypse crazy weapons. Um could be a nice combination i mean yeah. i don't really even know what's lurking in the post-apocalyptic montana region mutated cows i don't know who knows <laughs> yeah i hope they go um, weird with it i hope there's some weird stuff hiding because what we've seen like, so far is yes. i like throwing saw blades around so i'm gonna i'm fun. gonna say i'm gonna say uh that's got my my optimistic pick yeah you know i'll, I'll probably for me i think anthem is going to be I think it's going to be a mess at launch. Not not like bad per se, but I think it's going to have some launch issues. I just I just think that. So I don't know. Metro Exodus I think will be like the 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 PC gamers pick because it's you know a is it developed in Poland or yeah it's Polish developed yeah uh, which so it has enough of that like old timey PC game design weirdness and it's it's the Third in a what many people consider a series of cult classics, um, shooting monsters, curated single player experience. I don't know. It's got pretty graphics too. So it's the one I'm looking forward to because I like graphics and because I'm a single player gamer. Like I really, I'm old and I don't have time for all that multiplayer crap. <laughs> Just let me be a fair enough in my single player game. Fair enough. Oh, Evan also mentions Dead or Alive 6 is coming out that day. I didn't even know that was coming to PC. So, cool. Fighting. That's going to be a busy day. It's going to be a busy one. I don't even... <laughs> I can't even comprehend it at the moment. Um, we're going to have a lot to write about. All right. Uh, one more question. Oh, Zen Burning says, not a question, just a comment to say I love Chris Livingston's writing and articles. Oh, Aww, that's, very nice. that's so nice. Thank we you. Thank you, Chris. Um, run through these real quick. 
The Crafty Dog Subnautica Sub-Zero, the expansion, came out on Early Access today. Have you had any chance to try it? If so, what are your impressions? Haven't. I haven't, but uh, that's a good game. The The base game is good, so I'm sure there's something to love in there. We'll be looking at it as soon as we can. Um, da -da -da -da, PC Gamer, we need better controller support on PC. Not a question, but sure. Sure. Cool. But not controllers. <laughs> better controller support. Mm. Our UK is asking about NVIDIA prices. Oh, yeah, I didn't see the tag there. Um, will they lower their prices? I mean, like, there's no competition. That's that's the hard thing. That's why their prices are what they are. And even AMD, like, raised their prices. Like, the RX 590 is basically an RX 580 with a boost in performance of 12 to 15%, and it costs 30% more than the RX 580. So... You know, it's 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 a mess. Everyone got a little punch drunk on the cryptocurrency fever, where all their graphics cards that they ever made sold out. Um, I got to think like eventually the prices do come down, but keep in mind that Turing is a big chip. Um, yeah. Like you know, it's it's not Nvidia just jacking up the price because hey, this thing costs less, but we're going to charge more. It's like, eh, if you look at the sizes of the chips, it's it's basically the same as the equivalently priced of the previous generation. So, But if if AMD's Navi comes out this year and actually competes well, um, I think that would be the, the most likely time to see a price drop, like right before that. Yeah. Otherwise, it will just be a slow trend downward. I, I, I think you'll probably see things drop maybe $50 below their original MSRP this year. Okay. But you're not going to get a 20, 2080 Ti for like $700 anytime soon, I don't think. Dang. Well, Saturday. what about 400 I'll give you 400 Yeah. 300 200 Try it on eBay. Someone will send you a box of box. <laughs> and that is a good sign for ending the show. I think, is that Hank? Hank's tired of it. Hank's sick of it. Uh, that's that's not that's my dog. Oh, that's yours, Jared. I don't that's know. Scout. Scout. I'm up here. You can say hi to Scout. He's he's an Australian Shepherd. Oh, my dog was Australian Shepherd and Chocolate Lab. I love uh, those. Those are good dogs. Um, <laughs> the dog is angry at the <laughs> GPU prices. Um, let's call it there. Go, go attend to Scout and and hug him and and, and uh, tell him tell him it's gonna be all right. Love um, you guys. Love you, watchers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I'm trying to I'm trying to think and speak while the dog is barking, but uh, we'll catch you every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific yeah, time. Twitch.tv slash PC Gamer. You can catch us after the fact at uh, YouTube.com slash PC Gamer or PCGamer.com slash tag slash podcast. Oh, Scout, you're so beautiful. There he is. What a good dog. Oh, oh, so pretty, so pretty. Good way to end it. Some good, good puppy vibes. All right, everyone. We'll uh, see you next week. Bye. Bye.